Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Learning Insights, brought to you by Training Pros. When you have more projects than people, Training Pros can provide you with the right L&D consultant to start your project with confidence. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Learning Insights, and this is going to be a good one. But before we get into it, it's important to recognize our sponsor, Trading Pros. Without them, we could not be sharing these stories. Today on Learning Insights, we have Trudy Sullivan with Health Catalyst. Welcome, Trudy. Hi, Lee. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm excited to learn, first of all, what Health Catalyst is up to. How are you serving folks? Well, we are a leading provider of data and analytics technology and services to healthcare organizations. We're committed to being the catalyst for massive, measurable, data-informed healthcare improvement. So we work in partnership with our clients to produce improvements in the clinical, financial, and operational realms. And our vision is really to transform care for patients, um, every single patient on the planet. And then your global company? We are a global company. Yes, we've expanded um, over the last couple of years and uh, most recently added um, folks in the Middle East to the those that we are serving. And what's your role with the company? I am the Chief Communications and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, and I love both parts of, of my job. Um, I have been spending a lot of time, as you might imagine, in uh, 2020 and the early parts of 21 on equity. And um, as the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, uh, how are you kind of handling that? Because those are some difficult conversations. Yeah, we have been working to ensure that our team members, our clients, and all stakeholders understand that diversity and inclusion is an expansive, not a restrictive proposition. And while embracing it is definitely the right thing to do morally and ethically, we love sharing the business outcomes that are really represented and clear with data. Definitely greater diversity of thought drives greater innovation and competitiveness. So we try to show up every day aware of our own biases uh, with a commitment and a plan to listen to others whose experiences and perspectives are different from ours. And we get comfortable being uncomfortable, if you will, because we know that it's important and humility, self-awareness, and a recognition that we don't understand everything, especially in the context of diversity, will make us better. Now, from an organizational standpoint, when you kind of uh, go on this journey that you're on, um, how do you kind of create that safe space where people can be vulnerable and the people that um, are maybe the in the majority are able to kind of share what they're experiencing and and maybe open them up to some empathy that maybe they didn't have previously and to really understand the you know how how the minority is feeling about certain issues it seems like it's a it there's a lot of landmines and um how how do you navigate that in a kind of a safe way that that lets everybody be heard i think it's a great question lee and and this is um difficult but very important work and we like to start first by giving ourselves and others grace, grace to learn, to relearn, to unlearn, to forgive, to accept differences. And we have some timeless principles and values and cultural attributes that make some of this work a little bit easier. Um, one thing that we value greatly is humility. And that is, a, I think, a significant game changer for us if we can humbly um, approach a conversation with the perspective and the self-awareness that we don't understand everything, then that allows those in the majority and those in underrepresented groups to come together and support one another in meaningful ways, and most importantly, to learn from one another. And it's that learning that we try to harness um, to be able to continue to build and to grow and to change and to get folks, you know, to a place where, again, that being comfortable with being uncomfortable comes a little bit more naturally. So we actually work to counter bias with love and kindness. And it's a four-step process, if you will, of respectfully interrupting, questioning, kind of educating, and, and then having others around you begin to echo. And it's a wonderful approach because it begins to drive 
behavioral change and and set sort of the tone for people to do, like you said, kind of navigate in in somewhat choppy waters. Now, has this been something that's part of Health Catalyst DNA since the beginning, or is this an initiative that kind of bubbled up organically during all this recent kind of chaos? Actually, the wonderful thing about Health Catalyst, and I've just been there a little more than a year and a half, is the fact that the whole time the company's been working together, so think about more than a dozen years, this work has been front and center and these timeless principles have been honored. So when I arrived, we already had four affinity groups. Uh, we had a, a, a affinity group called Women Empowered or WE. We have an affinity group called Queers and Allies, Q&A for short. We have an affinity group for veterans and champions. And then this year we did create Shades, an affinity group for our team members of color. And those organizations over the course of many years have been doing tremendous work. And the company had worked really in a diligent and focused way on driving um, gender improvement. So while there have been opportunities this year to shift our work from an internal to an external perspective, um, we've we've made a lot of progress um, prior to, to facing the challenges of 2020. Externally, we now have a fantastic tool and capability, call it um, a health equity guidance assessment and solution that we're piloting uh, where we can, with the use of data, help folks zero in on the greatest opportunities for improvement inside hospital and healthcare systems to drive, to drive disparity out of care. And we're really excited about that. So we've been doing a bit more of that work this year. And I think the, there's a greater understanding because of the spotlight that COVID shined for us all on the socioeconomic indicators of health and the impact that that has had um, for communities of color from an infection and morbidity rate with regard to the pandemic. So we've got our affinity groups working to help us do this important and meaningful work inside and outside the company. And I'm really excited about that. So now this uh, initiative to kind of um, help others with the, you know, helping them with their diversity challenges they might be having in their healthcare organization. Is that like you kind of productize something that you were doing internally for yourselves that now you're offering as a service to your clients or that was just part of the offerings that you were offering? Well, we had the capability before and we all came together differently this year to make sure that more people were aware of the capabilities. And we've refined to a degree and productized, if you will, the assessment and the guidance solution. So the the, the data and the capability was there, but to your point, we did fine tune it a bit to help in these areas that we see um, where there's growing need. And so we've got this cross-functional task team that's supported by our Shades Affinity Group members. And we're thinking differently about the way in which we connect and carry out this mission-driven work more quickly and more meaningfully. So that's been a, a bigger pu- bigger push for us in the, in the second half of the year, for sure. And we envision the pilot coming to life over you know the first and second quarter and drawing more people in to continue to transform care for everyone. Now, uh, do you have any advice for leaders that are thinking about maybe starting some sort of affinity group? I know they're called different things in different organizations, but those kind of groups that are for certain groups of people within your organization was like, how did you decide on those initial four? Was that just kind of polling and getting a feel for, um, you know, who we have here and then just trying to serve them? Like, how did that, you know, how did you decide four, not five or six or instead of two? Like, how did that kind of come about? And, and maybe you can share some tactics for others that want to implement something along those lines. Sure. The affinity groups, or some people call them ERGs, employee resource groups, to your point, I've heard them called a variety of things, have come together organically. And I think that's where the greatest power lies when folks seeking belonging or affinity come together and gather, get to know one another, and then decide what kind of change or work that they want to do collectively together um, inside a company. And so our groups really formed very organically. And this year, there was just a greater impetus on the heels of um, George Floyd's murder uh, to to push more quickly on the the Shades Affinity Group work. 
And so there's a really beautiful framework that you can use that takes you through the process of supporting the evolution of an affinity group. And I think one of the most important elements of success for those organically grown groups is to have the championship support and visibility that comes from having a leader um, help them in whatever way they decide will be most useful. So we've applied some best practice techniques there in terms of providing support, providing those champions, providing training to our champions so that they're helping in the right way, and then just creating space um, for voices to be heard and to recognize and showcase and shine the spotlight on the work that's being done so that more people can, can get involved. Another best practice that we love is ensuring that when the group forms, there's an opportunity for champions and allies to join too. And this year we've gotten a little bit more deliberate and intentional around ensuring that our champions understand while it's beautiful that they show up to help, there may be times when they need to be invited to to attend. And there may be times where the group wants to work on things in their own way. And again, being able to give folks that space and support and offer an infrastructure and budget as needed has helped our groups uh, be successful. Supporting initiatives, for example, like this year, Shades launched a diversity dialogue series. And so as the champion for the Shades organization, I worked really hard to make sure we would have some budget to support outside speakers. And we've had phenomenal folks come in um, to help us learn and to think about things differently. And the group was really excited about doing it and sponsoring it, but they needed the resources. So I was able to provide that. And and thinking about how you approach that again with um, intentionality in mind is really important when you when you put the affinity groups together. The other thing that we think is important and we'll be embarking on this in our journey this year is finding a way for the affinity groups to come together to create even greater inclusion. And so we're <laughs> creating a diversity, equity and inclusion council and the leader from each one of our affinity groups uh, will join us to help us better understand where we can come together around important topics. So as an example, this year we're embracing intersectionality and we wanna learn as much as possible there. So each one of the affinity groups is participating in a panel and each one is participating in the development of a training curriculum and has participated in our screening of outside speakers to come in. And so we're getting greater, I think, benefit from us coming together than just having groups meet separately. And I think that's another good pre- best best practice to consider as you build your groups. Now, is there any, um, does it ever kind of leave the four walls of the organization? Is this something that uh, the group can then say, okay, I want to Uh, affect my community and I want to take the work we're doing here and then I want to help others outside of uh, Health Catalyst. Yeah, and that's another really fantastic best practice for affinity groups and those supporting them to think about. It's wonderful to come together and to celebrate. Like we've got a big celebration on Monday, obviously, with Martin Luther King Day, but it's even more important if our affinity groups can sink their teeth into being meaningful brand ambassadors and representatives in the community and driving strategic outcomes where the company needs help. And so I'll give you a couple examples. We um, love the partnership we have with CCG. So they host Women of Color STEM, an amazing conference. And then the Black Engineer of the Year Award Conference, Baya, which will be held in February. So our affinity group members have come together to help us from a planning perspective, show up and be visible in those settings. So again, providing the funding, but then the platform for folks uh, from the affinity groups to really strategically impact the outcomes of those efforts is something we're really focused on. We just had a meeting today about Bay, and I'm really excited to see what will come out of that job fair experience. And as an example, some of our Shades affinity group members will adjust their schedules so that they can be in the hiring booth um, talking to potential candidates about opportunities at Health Catalyst, which is a great example of the way they're helping us uh, in in 2021. So I, I love it when you see the evolution beyond just the gatherings inside the walls to the contributions um, outside the walls and doors of the company and our affinity groups doing a great job of that. Now, talk a little bit about how initiatives like yours and, and this in general can impact hiring 
How does this change um, maybe who you look for and, um, and giving those folks the opportunity, uh, maybe casting a wider net and maybe looking in places that, you know, you historically didn't look for talent. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a good question. The, the reality is, uh, when you start with the data, you've just got this beautiful platform of truth. And we believe in looking at the data, um, because it, you know, it really doesn't even have an opinion beginning to measure what matters using our affinity groups to do that and make sure you remember, you remember that if it matters, you're always measuring it. It's the only way we'll, we will improve. So when we look at data, if we see an area where we have imbalance, we work really hard to overcome that imbalance. Um, and if it's, you know, hiring um, and developing pipeline, there are opportunities for your affinity group members to influence your internship programs to identify places and spaces where they look to see opportunities, identifying spaces and places where it might be super important to be to be visible and to be present, like the two conferences that I mentioned, and there are, there are many, many more. But then, you know, actually being present there and being able to talk to folks about, you know, what it means to work for Catalyst. We're really proud of the fact that we have high levels of engagement and we've won several um, best place to work awards, I think more than 50 actually. And we most recently were, rec- were recognized for Glassdoor, um, by Glassdoor for those, um, those efforts and modern healthcare too. And our team members, um, all of our team members, you know, help us create those perceptions and build that brand. So having them involved, um, I had two meetings last week with folks who said, hey, have you thought about um, this platform, I think it was Jobwell, for connecting to a more diverse pool of interns. And we hadn't thought about it. So we were really eager to learn more and then develop a task, task team of those folks who brought the idea forward to help us get better in that space. So through diversity of thought and the participation of the affinity group members, we just become increasingly com- collaborative, more competitive, and more present in places we wouldn't know um, mattered to distinct demographics if we didn't have the chance to listen and learn from those folks. So it's um, there's a lot of beautiful synergy that comes from collaborating in that way and um, and getting out of the way and letting folks volunteer and be present um, in, in meaningful fashions. And we're excited about what will come at Baya. So for example, they've got really cool award categories and we can't wait to get there because we've got two team members who for the first time ever will be recognized at that setting Uh, and in that setting. And our team members from the affinity group are helping us think about how we want to show up and celebrate them too. They're working on the communication planning. They're working on pulling leadership in. They're interviewing and talking to our award winners. So it's, um, it's a really great thing to have the additional support, but more importantly, the additional innovative thinking that comes from the diversity of thought. And it sounds like those affinity groups really are an engine that really helps in a lot of different areas in the in the regard of diversity. Yeah, you know, they're the additional arms, legs, brain power that you always wish you you had, um, and they come with just an incredible gift of passion around driving change and passion around you know whatever it takes even it's out if it's outside work hours to make a meaningful difference so you see the passion the persistence the um really the the patience even as as we work through the process of realigning resources or supporting one another um for example our women empowered group in 2020 had to really quickly pivot to make the women's conference that they hosted called reaching new heights virtual, you know, that was early on in the pandemic while we were all still figuring out what does that look like? What tools are available? And there was such optimism around doing that and such passion around getting it right. It was probably one of the best women's conferences I've ever attended. And we all learned from that. Like we all thought differently about Zoom breakout rooms and um, how do you present and still get engagement and how much time should we spend, you know, presenting versus actually allowing people to talk and is chat functionality better than open mics? But we learned through that affinity group's efforts and their successes. And it was it was a beautiful sight to behold. And I can't wait for their next one. But again, I think we probably wouldn't have done as great of a job if we hadn't had um, those volunteers and all the extra energy um, and the, the dedication of time that they committed to that effort. 
um, we wouldn't have been nearly as um, successful without them. And they own it. It's really their celebration and their conference. Now, has that kind of leadership within those affinity groups translated to maybe um, career advancement opportunities because these folks are getting seen by people higher up that maybe they're getting exposure to folks that they hadn't seen before and they're getting to see them, you know, achieve things and make things happen. And so they're seen in a different way maybe than they are in their normal job. But so has that translated to any kind of job advancement because of their leadership in these affinity groups? Yeah, I think that happens relatively often in affinity group environments. And as you look at the pipeline and developing your high potential uh, pool of talent, your high potential pool of diverse talent, and, and you look at succession planning, you're spot on in thinking that these leadership opportunities that present themselves, that maybe the day jobs wouldn't provide or the stretch assignments that the affinity group activities create do translate into greater visibility for those folks doing the work and greater opportunities because they expand the network of who they know and who knows them in unique and meaningful ways ways built specifically on the contributions they've delivered in certain areas. And definitely we've got this incredible egalitarian cohort of leaders for women um, leading us in our shades activities. And the work that they're doing it definitely transcends what's happening in our meetings. So for example, one of our leaders was relatively new to us via acquisition and had great ideas about how to showcase the health equity assessment tool to our new clients that we gained via the acquisition. And she organized several different meetings with several different leaders inside the company that she guaranteed would have taken her longer to meet and would have taken them longer to get a chance to see how phenomenal she is if she hadn't embraced the role as a contributing member on the leadership team side of the affinity group, and then just found the space for her voice to be heard around these innovative ideas. So there's definitely a path there for promotion for folks and just a great opportunity to build new skills that your day job doesn't allow you to do. So I love the diversity ecosystem for that reason as well. Now, this must be really rewarding work for you and the passion in your voice kind of gives it away how how important it is to you. What's the hard part? What are what are some of the challenges when you're implementing one of these programs? Oh, you know, I am super passionate about this work and it and it can be it can be challenging. And I, you know, am grateful that I have a really good leader who's Our CEO is such a servant oriented leader and so mission driven that, you know, every day he he helps all of us, I think, be mindful that um, if we can ground ourselves in our timeless principles and remember to openly listen to others and to be respectful and to just cherish the value of what each one of us bring each day, it gets easier. And again, that grace and discernment. Uh, that we talked about earlier is so important, but I try to back up and look at how much you can achieve before you see maybe the measurable outcomes you're looking for. So there's a lot of tactical activity that can distract you. But again, if you go back to the data and look at where you're making improvements, um, that's what really inspires me and keeps me positive. And when I see that there are more people who understand why diversity thought matters um, and understand that inclusion is beneficial to everybody. That is really inspiring and sort of, and and gives me, it gives me a lot of hope and the change that we're making, I think at the corporate level and so many companies have done really great work on an accelerated basis this year that's just a wonderful foundation for us to think about because the the companies that we're all part of make up the foundation of of our economy and what our nation thinks about. And so I get pretty inspired because I believe that our best practices and our results can help us drive change at that broader level too. And every day, just role modeling, why you might have a different opinion. I mean, look at all the things that there are to be, you know, to be polarized and divisive about today. If you can shift that and think of it as a challenge, like how can I come together with somebody and learn from them in a way that will be useful 
you know, whether it's again on should, should my 82 year old father get a vaccination and my discussion with my two sisters, all varying opinions, right? If you apply these practices and principles, it's really beautiful to see what comes from it. And so I try to stay, you know, positive and focused on all that we're achieving because it wasn't that long ago for me in my career where I really felt isolated as the only woman in most settings and oftentimes was left out and sometimes excluded or talked over. And when I see how far we've come just in most companies and in most settings, um, I just get really excited about what's around that next corner. So I'm glad to see more, more and more people learning. And I think you've probably seen the data point too around hiring for chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officers. It's, you know, from C-suite growth, 84% higher than any other position being filled at the C-suite level is the chief diversity equity and officer position. Like how exciting is that, right? When you talk about learning and growing together and driving change, there's so many of us investing because we know there's an opportunity to get better. And that alone gives me such optimism and hope. So uh, before we wrap, any last piece of advice for that CEO out there that hasn't pulled the trigger and hired their diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, lead yet? What what should they be thinking and, and what why should they do it right away? I think, again, if, if CEOs remember how incredibly expansive diversity and equity and, inc- and inclusion is and embrace that it's the right thing to do on so many levels, if they find a wonderful partner in, an, in a chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, and they show up every day just with an awareness of their own bias and a desire to learn and to grow, to relearn, to unlearn, and to do better, the outcomes that they'll achieve from a business perspective, culturally and operationally, and from a financial perspective, will be so motivational that I'm confident they'll continue to invest not just in that leadership's or that leader's capability, but in the function of diversity, equity, and inclusion too. I just think, you know, again, just taking that first step, um, looking at the data, seeing where it's best to start, finding a good partner, moving out. It's, you know, one step at a time. And, you know, you can walk, or as some folks say, what is it? Crawl, walk, run. Um, And really actually move pretty quickly in today's environment to drive meaningful change. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story today. Um, What do you need more of? How can we help you? Are you looking for more talent? You're looking, uh, what what do you need? How can we help? Yeah, we'd love to have folks take a look at our website. We do have some open positions and we're looking for diverse slates of candidates. Um, We'd love to be able to continue to learn what best practices are helping others. And we'd love to learn more about the ways people are overcoming disparity in care, just because I think that that's going to be an issue of importance for all of us as we continue to learn and, um, and move through, you know, the second, um, the second wave of COVID. So any thoughts and ideas in that space or different ways to look at what we might be doing from an equity assessment and partnership perspective would be really meaningful. And again, you know, we love to learn. That's one of our other commitments. We're dedicated to continuous learning. So, you know, any areas that will make us more innovative and supportive as we try to drive the transformation of healthcare for every patient on the planet, we we definitely want to learn and want to partner and want to continue to to embrace um, what will make us better. And that website is healthcatalyst.com, right? Yes, correct. Thank you. And then if somebody wants to connect with you um, directly, LinkedIn under your name, Trudy Sullivan, is probably an easy way to get a hold of you. Yeah, that's a great way to get a hold of me. And I do try to respond. And I've learned so much from connections over the last year. There's a lot of incredible work going on in this practice. And it's I've been doing this for a long time, a couple of decades, actually. And like I said, we've seen so many gains but the technology and the thinking and the innovation that's out there now, every day I probably get a new note from somebody and I think, wow, I had no idea. Like, you know, the gender decoding of job descriptions, um, it, just all kinds of things that are hot and evolving. I love to learn more and, and really embrace and welcome when people reach out to me. Well, thank you again, Trudy, for sharing your story today. You're doing important work and we appreciate you.
Thank you, Lee. And I appreciate being a part of the discussion and of the show. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We'll see you all next time on Learning Insights. And remember, this work could not be done without our friends at Training Pros. Please support them so we can continue to share these important stories. Thank you for listening. For more information about Training Pros, visit their website at training-pros.com.